This video is created for the Linux Operating System and Development Environment course at Maladona University. Before watching this video, we recommend that you complete Module 13. So in this module we're going to talk about Linux system and user security. So to begin with I want to point out that Linux is a multi-user operating system, which means that in our system we can have multiple users. And these users can work with the system either simultaneously or one at a time. So if we have a computer, we can share it. Multiple users can have accounts on the computer. So when we have multiple users working simultaneously on a computer, we need a way to restrict what resources each user can access. So maybe I have a home folder and I want to I want you to be able to access my home folder but I don't want to allow you the rights to modify my files. This is a sort of restriction I can apply so that you have access to my folder but you cannot modify my files. But maybe I have another folder that I want to completely hide from you or from other users in the system, then I need to apply those sorts of restrictions on my folder. So when we speak about file security in Linux, we talk about these types of restrictions. So in the chapter that you have worked on, and in this video, we're gonna clarify how are these accomplished in Linux? How can we protect files and resources? So what can we protect? So these are a couple of examples. We can protect folder access. So only specific users can access our folder. Maybe file access. You can see that we have a file, but you cannot enter the file. You cannot read the binary content in the file. But also, maybe, maybe we want you to be able to read our file, but we don't want you to be able to modify the file. So these are different kinds of restrictions, but each of these are restrictions in some way. We restrict another user for, from performing some certain actions like modifying or viewing or entering a folder. So when you created your virtual machine and when you installed Ubuntu, you created a user. And you created the user by by the installation medium asking you for a username and it asked you for a password. And when you entered those, the system automatically created that user for you. But in a server and in the terminal, maybe you want to create a user after the installation has completed. So how do we do that with the terminal? How do we create a user? Well, there's the command user add for that, which adds a user to the system. So the argument for user add is the username that we want to add to the system. And of course, user add has a couple of options that does specific stuff. So you should review the man fi manual file for that. Uh, but once you have added a user to the system, you cannot really use that user until you have set a password for the user. So setting a password is a different command. So that's the passwd command, and that will set the actual password for the user. So we need to add a user, and we need to change the password for the user. After we have done that, we can actually log into the system with, uh, with a terminal as this user or graphically. So, where are user information stored in Linux? Well, user information you can find in the etc passwd file. So for all users in the system, they have a row in that file that specifies the username, the password location, like if it's if it's stored in the shadow file which we will speak about in the next slide uh, it's specified there uh, 
if we have some sort of additional information like the full name of a user, a room number, uh, the telephone number and so forth, that's actually specified in the passwd file. Also, when the user initiates a terminal session to the system, what terminal application do we want to start? And that would usually be bash, which is the only terminal application we speak about in this course. So you will find that, okay, when this user logs into the system, we will start bash for him. But that could be something else. So we can modify that in the etc passwd file. And the passwd file has a manual page and you can access that by manual and specify section 5, which is files and directories, and then the name of this file, which is passwd. So let's, let's look at this. The file passwd. So let's open it with the less command. So this terminal is connected to this machine with SSH. So let's look at the content in that specific file. And we can see that there's a lot of different users in the system. And what these users are, we will touch on later. But we see that our user NetCenter, which was the user I created during the installation process, is listed in this file. So what are these different columns, what, uh, what do they specify? Well, we can find that out if we look into the manual fine, uh, file. So the, section, uh, the column names are listed here. So the first column is the login name. The second column is the encrypted password. The third column is the numerical user ID. So when we speak about users in the system, we talk about usernames. But in the background, the Linux system knows your user as some specific ID, some numerical ID. Because systems like integers better than strings, as you may know. Um, we have a comment field, the home directory. So we, we have a home directory and the location of that home directory is specified in the etc file, uh, password file. So we don't, we don't need to have our home directory in the slash home slash net center. We can actually change that by modifying this file. And this is the user command interpreter, which is what terminal do we want to start when this user logs in to our system? What is the application we want to run? And, and uh, if we look at uh, in the file again, we can see that when NetCenter logs into the system, we start bash for him or her. This was the home directory. This was the numerical user ID. This was the group ID of the user. So the user has a primary group, which you can read about in the material. And this was the this was the comment field. And this was the password. Does this look like an encrypted password for you? Well, the X actually specifies that this password is not stored in this file. So I will start the slides again. When there's an X in the password column, it means that the password is stored in a file named etc shadow. And the shadow file also has a manual page, which specifies the column in the file, how the file is, uh, what's the purpose of the file and so on. But the issue with etc password file, so at the very beginning of Linux, password Passwords were actually stored here. But the issue is that this file is publicly readable by all users on the system. So that you can know uh, what is the username of, of that uh, ID and what is the username of that ID and so forth. So, so this file is public accessible so that all users can see 
uh, what's the usernames of different IDs on the system. But we don't really want to store user system passwords in a publicly accessible file. That is not a good idea. Because that means that anyone in our system can try to decrypt the passwords for other users. So we could just see that, okay, NetCenter, and say that we had an encrypted password right here. Then we could just copy it and try to decrypt it. So what, what they did instead was to move the passwords to ETC Shadow, which you will see that it is not publicly accessible. Only the root user and maybe, maybe some speci other specific users can access this file. The permission is denied. So if we want to access this file, we need to access it as the root user. So we do that by writing sudo before we, we launch the less command. So now we are root and we can access this file. And we can see that, okay, here is the encrypted version of NetCenter's password. And you find a lot of other users as well. Great. So what exactly happens when you add a user to the system? So say that you, you sit at the system and you type user add Lisa as the root user, of course. You are the root user, so you, you can add new users. And you type user add Lisa. What happens? Well, the system actually modifies the etc passwd file to add this new user and the etc shadow file to add the password for this user. But the password will actually be empty, so you cannot use the password. You will not be able to log in as Lisa to the system. You need to modify the password, and you do, you do that with the passwd command. You type the username, and then you specify the password that Lisa should have. And that will go in and modify the shadow file and insert the encrypted password into the file. So if you recall from my demonstration earlier, you could see that there's a lot of different users in my system. And you will find these in your system as well. So what are these accounts? Well, I should not include a root here. So please ignore that root is marked. But what are these other accounts? What, what types of users are they? They are called system accounts, so system users. And these are not used by you personally when you log into the system. These accounts are actually used by application that runs in your system that needs some specific permissions to access specific files. One very basic example of this is a web server. So in the networking slides, I presented how, how Apache works uh, or how, how a web server works very basically. And Apache is a web server uh, that, that we can take as reference. And when you install Apache 2, when you install a package Apache 2, each time you start your computer, a Apache 2 application will launch automatically and be, run, be running in the background so that your server can actually respond to uh, HTTP requests even though you are not logged into the system. So when we have a request to the Apache server, what do Apache need to do to respond to this uh, request? So say that this, re this request uh, requests a website from Apache 2. Well, Apache 2 needs to go into the file system to collect the source of this web, uh, web page and return this to the uh, requester. 
But who determines if the Apache 2 applications has permission to read this specific file? That is determined by the system account that Apache 2 is uh, bounded to or that, that uh, Apache 2 runs under. And Apache 2 runs under the www data uh, system account. So, so we, could, we could, just for demonstration purposes, let's install Apache 2. Uh, and let's see if it is the password, if we can find the www data account here somewhere. I, I don't, I'm not sure if this was maybe here before I installed Apache 2, that might be, but Apache 2 uses the www slash data account. And this has user ID 33 and group ID 33. and. Uh, what is the shell that started if you try to log in with this uh, account? The user has been no login application. Do you think this will take you to a shell like bash? No. So this is like a security measurement to make sure that if you for some reason manage to log into this account, you will just be sent directly to an application that will close the session. So, um, yeah. So to make sure that Apache can actually access these files, you need to make sure that the www data account can access the files. And the root account. The root account is specified by the user ID zero. So whenever user ID zero tries to access a file or a folder or tries to do something with the system like removing a file or removing a folder, that is always permitted. So if user ID zero tries to do something, that's permitted always. Uh, and root, as we can see, also have a line in this etc passwd file with the user id 0 group id 0 and it also has a it also starts bash if we successfully log in as root so how do we run commands as root so sometimes we we actually need to run commands as root when we install packages, when we want to remove files that's owned by root or owned by someone else, but we still need to remove them, we need to remove them as the root user because the root user will have the permissions to do such things. So we can use the sudo command before any other command, which will temporarily switch over to the root account and run the command we specify as arguments. We could also completely switch to the root account with a su command. Let's demonstrate this. So the sudo I have already shown you. You type sudo and the command that you want to run. So this command is the command that will run, be run by the root user. In the SU case, you, you need to know root's password you know, to be able to log in as root. With Ubuntu, you don't specify a root password, so there's no way we can log in as root with the SU command. So what we instead can do, we can temporarily log in as root with the sudo command and say that we want to switch user to root, and we will be able to do this because the sudo gives us the privileges to do such thing. So we just need to specify our password, but, but because I did that earlier, the sudo will remember this, and in this case I did not have to specify the password, because I did that 
a couple of commands ago. So now you can see in our terminal session we are actually logged in as root. So everything we do now is permitted. So even though root does not own the documents folder, we can remove that if we want to. But let's remove the videos folder. We need the R flag of course, and root can do this, even though root is not the owner of this folder. So in the material you will also read about groups. And groups is also a way for us to control access to files. So we can we can make a file, we can set a file to be owned by a group, and then all users that belong to a specific group in our system will be able to do something with the file. So with groups, we can do such things as collaboration in folders so that only users that are a part of the developer groups, for example, are allowed to modify this folder. And you will work with this in the project. So I will not cover every detail in this presentation because you will work with this in the project. So groups also have a file in the etc folder it's called etc group and you can add a group with the sudo group add developers command so with the group add command I, I added the developers group and that will insert a line to to the etc group file with this specifying this group and the users that's member of this group that's also specified in the etc group file but we have not had the time to add a user yet so the membership column is empty but we can add a user to the group with the user mod command and we specify that we want to append information to this user we do not want to specify all the properties and attributes of this user we want to append and what we want to append to the user is that the user is also a, a member of the developers group so the user mod is also something you will work with in the project you will modify user attributes and you do that with the user mod command and you could say there's a correlation between the user mod command and the etc password file in that, that each of these columns you can modify with the user mod. So these are properties of individual users that you can actually modify with the user mod command. Also the password, but that will actually modify the shadow file. Or maybe, uh, can you modify the password with user mod? I'm not sure. You can, you can specify some password uh, policies. Oh, you can set up. Looks like you can set a password as well with a password flag. So you can do a lot of things with the uh, user mod command. A lot of user attribute modifications. So when we run this command, the user mod develop, uh, developers John it will not modify the etc passwd file it will only m modify the member associations in the etc group file so it will add john in the column that specify uh, specifies the members of this group so what you need to understand before we go into permissions and uh, restrictions is that all files and folders are owned by a user and a group. So for each file and folder in the system there is a property that specifies the user owner and the group owner of a file and these ownerships 
uh, modifies the res uh, how, how other users are restricted and what access they have to individual files. So there's a user owner and a group owner of a file. So let's let's actually look into how can we verify a ownership and modify ownership. To verify a ownership of a file, we can use the ls command and we can specify the long listing because that will list the user that owns this folder or file and the group. So this is the user owner and this is the group owner. These are actually the restrictions that apply for the user. In this case, as I marked, these are the what the user owner are allowed to do. This, uh, this is what the group members are allowed to do with the file. Read and execute in this case. This was read, write and execute. And what others are allowed to do with the file. And with others, we mean people that are not the owner of the file uh, or the, a group owner of the file. Okay, so let's go in the documents folder and uh, create a empty file, file.txt. And let's see who, who is now the owner of this file and the group owner. So the owner is netcenter and the group owner is also netcenter. So there's a group for my user. So uh, the installation process created this group for us so that we have a personal group for the, my user. And if I want to change the owner of this file, I do that with a change ownership command. Let's look at uh, the syntax with the manual page. So we can see that we can specify some options and then we specify the owner and we can also specify a group if we want to. And lastly, as an argument, the file that we want to change the ownership of. So let's start by creating a user John. That should have modified the etc password file. We can, we can verify that. Yes, it did. Let's see how that modified the etc shadow file. Oh, we have permission denied, so we run it with sudo. And we can see that the password uh, is actually blanked out with an exclamation mark. Which, will mean, which means that this user does not have a password, thus you cannot log in with this user. So before we can log in with this user, we need to set the password for him. So set the password test, test. So let's with the su command log in as John instead. So now we see we are actually logged in as John. Okay, great. I'm back. I'm logged in as NetCenter now. Let's change the ownership of file.txt to John. Let's verify our changes. And yes, indeed, the new owner of the file is John. Which means that John should now be able to modify this file. He did not have the right permissions earlier, so he could not modify the file previously, but now he can since he's the owner of the file. If we want to change the group of owner of a file, we can do that with the change group command, specify the group name and the file name. But we have not created the developers group yet, so let's do that first. Uh, 
group ad developers let's try to rerun this command so now John is the user owner and developers is the group owner of the file so let's look at the etc group file to see uh, to look at the developers group and uh, here we can see that it does not have any users associated with it so let's say that we want John to be a part of the developers group we could do that with the user mod command we want to append information about to this user and we want to specify that the group that the user wants to be added to is developers so that should have modified our file and John is now specified as a member of this group developers so the permissions that's applied to files owned by the developers group are also applied to our user great that was everything i had for this uh, presentation i hope you learned something and i'll see you in the next video